to another virtual call. Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to Financial Aid Night. Um, we have a handful of folks here on the call to help kind of talk a little bit about different um, financial aid options for your students. I'm gonna introduce everybody in one quick second. I just wanna remind everybody that we are recording this so that we can upload it for um, parents and guardians who couldn't be here. Um, and so uh, the screen jumps to whoever is talking. And so if everybody could just keep their microphone muted, um, and then if you have questions, you can jump uh, over to the chat um, and we'll monitor that throughout. Um, and we'll definitely answer questions at the end. We'll stop recording and folks can unmute and ask questions then as well. Okay, but we'll get through most of this um, and, uh, and then we'll turn the recording off. Um, so I'm Lacey Guest. I am the College and Career Counselor here at College Grove High School. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce the other folks here with me. So we have Vicki Evans and Rex Basting. Good evening. Sorry. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> and Jamie Reynolds. Hello. And we'll take turns um, and change it up for you guys so that financial aid isn't too dry of a topic. Okay, let's get started. All right. So in general, um, a lot of your seniors are probably um, starting to think about or maybe have solid plans for um, their next steps after high school. And this year we have a lot of things in place to help them kind of do that exploration. Um, we're doing career advisories this year where students will use um, CIS, that first kind of bullet point there. It's um, an online software system that helps students um, take personality tests and um, assessments to help them navigate what they might be really good at or what they might be interested in in terms of career plans. Um, we have a ton of different opportunities to preview colleges, um, meet with industry folks, um, go on field trips, do job shadows. We have all of these opportunities available for your student to kind of test out what might be a good next step. Um, all students have to do is reach out to us. Um, and so um, any of us are, are happy to help guide your student to opportunities that might benefit them. Um, but please, please encourage them to come talk to us about um, what their future plans might be and what we can do to help them um, navigate all of these different opportunities because I know it can be overwhelming. Um, there are uh, plenty of um, non-college options, and we'll talk a little bit about how financial aid applies to those as well tonight. Um, so you can see here um, we have apprenticeship programs listed um, as a viable option, and we have um, an abundance of information about that as well. If your students want to chat a little bit more about that or do some research about apprenticeship programs in the state of Oregon, um, that's a great training tool and educational option for after high school if they want to go into the trades. Um, and we'll have field trips and job shadows and things available around that as well. But all of that is to say that there are a ton of different post high school options. They're all valid um, and we're here to help your student figure out which is the next step for them. Um, we do encourage your students to keep track of their experiences um, so that they can talk about them in scholarship applications and in um, resumes and cover letters and things like that. All right, so what is financial aid? Um, Every year I hear from parents, and I'm sure um, the counselors do as well, um, I don't want my kid to have financial, to use financial aid, we don't want to be in debt. And we hear that a lot, and our responses are always, there's so many different kinds of financial aid and they do not all equal debt, right? They're not all loans. Um, and so financial aid is kind of just that umbrella term. Um, it's all of the different money, all of the different ways that students and families pay for different educational costs and expenses. Um, and it does help to make um, college and uh, training after high school uh, more accessible for families and for students. So this is my nice little graphic because I use that term umbrella term all the time. So you can see the cost of higher education is looming large above in the graphic, but um, there's so many different ways um, to kind of uh, sh shield students from the torrential downpour of loans and uh, expenses like that. So there are scholarships and grants, which are free money. 
Um, you'll also see under here work study, um, which is an opportunity for students to have an on-campus job. Um, and then there's savings plans and IDAs, and we're going to dive into each one of these. All of these um, raindrops over to the right are money that students don't have to pay back. And of course, these are our number one choices, right? Um, in terms of financial aid, we want students to get that free money first um, and only take out loans if it's absolutely necessary. And we're here to help your child try to figure out all of the free money they can get um, before we resort to loans. Is this one still me? Okay. Nope, this one's me. I got oh, it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So one of the first steps for financial aid, well, I shouldn't say one of it. This is the first step for financial aid is filling out the FAFSA or ORSA. Um, so the FAFSA, many of you have heard of it. It is the free application for federal student aid. Um, and then the ORSA is, I should remember what it stands for, but is it listed on there? Oh, the Oregon Student Aid application, it is on there. Um, and you will not fill them both out, it's one or the other. So students that are documented students would fill out the FAFSA, and if students are undocumented or working on it, they would fill out the ORSA. And the FAFSA, again, is a federal um, application. The ORSA is for the state of Oregon. Um, they're essentially the same thing, um, but it's just based on your, um, if you're documented or undocumented at the moment. Okay, so if you ever have questions or need to look up anything about the FAFSA, you can find just about everything on studentaid.gov if you want to just Google that. You can see up there we put the, um, the web address for student aid. That's the start of filling, filling out the FAFSA. Um, but they have a lot of FAQs on there. You can go on there to, to do just about anything or find out any information. So the FAFSA did open on October 1st. Um, if you haven't filled it out, that's okay. Don't worry, there's still time to fill it out. Um, students will fill it out starting October 1st all the way through. Um, it, you can go into the spring, but it is better to do it sooner than later, especially if there are questions about it where we can help. Um, when you start filling out the FAFSA, you will, the first thing you actually really need to do is make an FSA ID. Um, the FSA ID is how you sign the FAFSA. And what's really important is that you have your own FSA ID as a parent and that the student has an FSA ID. And then the really other important part is that you write this down. So every year that the student fills out the, the FAFSA, you will need your FSA ID to sign it. And it saves a lot of time and effort if you have that stored in your notes on your phone or if you've got it written down somewhere that you're not going to forget. Um, so again, please make sure you have an FSA ID. And also, if you have an um, older student that's in college, you'll use the same FSA ID. So the parent, yours doesn't change, the student will have their own. So you can use it for multiple students, well, multiple of your, of your own students. Um, when you fill out the FAFSA again, make sure that when you click on the application, you are clicking on the 2324 application. It usually gives you two options. It'll say the 2223 or the 2324. Make sure we're picking the 2324 because that'll be their freshman year next year of college. Um, or if they're using the FAFSA for um, any of their other you know, trade schools or things like that. Um, the other thing that's really handy, if you do your taxes online or have someone prepare them online, you can use what's called the data retrieval tool, and that will also save you a lot of time and effort. Um, if you didn't don't have access to that, when you fill out the FAFSA, just make sure you have a copy of your taxes with you from the 21 um, year. Um, you can do it on your phone. It says it's mobile friendly. Uh, it, I don't like to do it on the phone as much. It's, to me, it's a lot harder to see, but you can do it if that's your only option. Um, and the FAFSA, again, uh, like Ms. Guest said, it is kind of like the, the, the door into financial aid. It's not just for um, loans. You can also get grants, and a lot of scholarships will ask for information from your FAFSA. And these are a few things they'll take into account. They'll take into account your income, how many people live in your household, um, first generation college student, or if you have other college students in your house that are attending college right now. So there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, 
it shouldn't be too difficult. It takes a little bit of time, but again, if you have questions about it and you're doing it at home, please feel free to call us. And then we will also have a night. I think we'll talk about this in a little bit. We'll have a night where you can come into the school and get help if you need it. Okay, and this is another one of the big questions that we get when people are filling out the FAFSA. Who is my parent? So you can see this little graphic on here. If you don't have time to memorize the whole thing, that's okay. You can find it on the, the FAFSA website. Um, but if you want to follow us really quickly, we'll just go over a couple of them. So if you are married as parents, you'll report both of your incomes. Um, if, your par if you as parents don't live together, then you will report information for both parents even if you're not living together. If they're, you're separated, but you still you know, file taxes, you can still report, report both parents. But if you are divorced um, and one, your student lives with one parent more than the other, you'll report that parent as the main person on the FAFSA. Um, and a lot of questions we have around here are, you know, well, what if I live with my grandparents? What if I live with my aunt or uncle? Um, those, you would not report on your FAFSA unless they have legally adopted you. Um, so unless you're living with you know, parents or grandparents that have legally adopted you, you won't report anyone else on the FAFSA. Um, did I skip any other ones that are really important? If you, so if you are divorced but remarried, again, you would add both of those parents on the FAFSA. Um, any other ones that I missed, Vicki or Lacey, that we need to go over right now? Okay. So when you fill out the FAFSA, you will get an email eventually that has your student aid report. So this is a little snapshot of someone's student aid report. Um, some of the information is blocked out, but it'll look something like this. Um, so this person applied or is applying to the University of Oregon. That's where they'd like to go. Um, and down in the bottom left corner where the red boxes are, if you see the first one, it says estimated expected. So estimated family contribution. So that's your EFC. A lot of um, scholarships and schools will ask you for your EFC. So that's a really important number to, to, to keep and to know what that is. On the right hand side in the other red box, you'll see that this person it says Pell Grant estimate. So that means based on their income, they are eligible for around $5,800 in Pell Grant, which again is free money. That's one you don't have to pay back. Um, and below that it also says they're eligible for a direct Stafford loan. So again, that is a loan. That's something that would have to be paid back. And that's what we wanna um, use as a last, um, last resort. Uh, we wanna go with the free money and scholarships and things like that first. Okay, so on the next slide, we did just a little example here. Um, tuition has definitely shot up in the last few years. Um, so tuition at U of O, so again, just an example, tuition at U of O is about $15,000 for the year. Okay, books and supplies are around a thousand and don't let that number scare you either. A lot of times you can find the books used, you can find them online, there's other ways to do it so you wouldn't have to, have to spend a thousand dollars on books. And for this student, if they wanna live at home, so their total would be $16,000. And let's say their EFC was $2,000. So that's how much the FAFSA says their parents or the student can contribute to their education. And then add in their Pell Grant, that leaves just over $8,000 that they would need to pay the University of Oregon to attend school. So going along with that, there are more opportunities for grants. There's one called the Oregon Opportunity Grant. There are a lot of scholarships that are available for students to fill out, and we will fill out again a lot of these in senior seminar kind of throughout the year. And the main one will be the local scholarships that we do in January. Um, and so again, listed on here is the FSA ID. Um, make sure you do that. And if you're curious about your know, estimations for how much you might owe, there's a thing called the FAFSA forecaster that again you can find at studentaid.gov. Okay, this next part um, 
is on me. I, again, I'm Vicki Evans. I'm one of the counselors this year. I have the 10th and 11th graders, but I've been working with the scholarship and the scholarship committees for about the past 15 years or so. And I don't know if many of you know this, but we have a huge support system when it comes to money and supporting our seniors going off to school. And so the city of Cottage Grove community each year gives about a hundred thousand dollars, which is quite amazing um, to our seniors that are moving on. And so I always tell students always apply because really what the intention is for this money is to help every student who's going on to any type of edu educational program is to help them get a good start. And so there are years when students um, you know, may end up having the majority of their school paid for, depending upon where they're going just from Cottage Grove, um, our community base. So a lot of times students will also say, you know, I don't think I can apply for any scholarships because I haven't done that much or my grades aren't that good. We really encourage all students to apply for a, as many scholarships as possible. I always tell them it's kind of like playing the lottery. If you don't buy a lottery ticket, you're not going to ever win. Um, you need to fill out these applications and they're based on a variety of things. So academic merit is their GPA. Um, some are based on higher GPA. We actually have some that are based on lower GPAs. So there's people in our community that feel like students that might have a 2.5 really need the same option opportunities as other students to get started. So um, GPAs have a wide range for scholarships. Um, some are need-based, and again, that goes back to the FAFSA. And so there's oftentimes parents feel a little funny about filling that out because they say, I'm not you know, going to be qualified for any um, money, but oftentimes scholarships will use that FAFSA as a way to say, hey, these parents aren't going to receive any federal money. Let's make sure we give them plenty of local scholarship money to help their student get started. Um, also extra um, special skills or talents. So that might be students involved in music or drama. Um, extracurricular activities could be community service or any of the other clubs and organizations that have activities here at the high school. There also are scholarships based on membership. So if you as parents are members of SELCO or Northwest Community Credit Union, um, who you're employed by, unions, if you belong to the Elks Club, all of those organizations have scholarships and our students are really competitive for those. Um, it might be personal characteristics. So that might be something like their first generation going to college. Um, Maybe they're the caretaker in their family and they're watching grandparents or they have to watch siblings. Um, some of those different characteristics come up as they fill out applications in the um, essay portion. Um, life circumstances, this is going to be a large one for students this year because of going through COVID. So I think that's a really valid opportunity to talk about how they were impacted those couple years. And so um, there's lots of scholarships again out there that are looking for students who have overcome some hardships. And then the last one is diversity. And it's not just their um, racial or ethnic diversity, but also diversity in their geographic region, um, maybe socioeconomic. There's diversity can look at a lot of different things. So I don't want students to just kind of get narrowed in on one type of diversity. Okay, as far as finding scholarships, um, we have a wide range of scholarships that we offer here at the high school. Um, and I'll talk about those in one second. I don't wanna jump ahead, but um, the colleges that your students are applying to, that's one bank of scholarships that they can apply to. So if they're looking at LCC or U of O or any of the other four-year schools, um, they all have under their financial aid tab scholarships, sometimes, they have a separate scholarship application that students need to watch for as far as those deadlines. Sometimes it's embedded within their application. So that's a really good place to start looking. Another um, is the OSAC. 
and Rex and Lacey will be walking your students in senior seminar. Every single one of them will walk through the OSAC. They all will apply for Oregon Promise and they all will start on the OSAC. So just know that your students will have a lot of guidance there, step-by-step um, -step instructions. And then going back to our website, we will have all of our local scholarships posted there. Again, that's the Community Foundation, all of the ones through Cottage Grove. <clears throat> and also um, we put state scholarships and national scholarships. So there's, a, again, a wide range. And we find that our students are super competitive. Even if they're applying for ones throughout the state, our students just have done such a great job. They end up with quite a bit of money. The other thing that's important for students to know is um, that it doesn't take that long often to fill out these scholarships. Some of them are more involved. And so it may take them an hour to fill out the application, write their essays. Maybe it takes them two hours. But if they get $2,000, that's $1,000 an hour that they've just earned. And we do have one particular scholarship. It's one for CTE, for students that have taken some of our career and technical classes. Um, those students all received, everybody that applied and met the requirements, all received $1,000. That application took 12 minutes. So just know that Again, we can't emphasize this enough. There is money out there. Um, also through community organizations, possibly your local church. Um, again, some of the VFW, the Elks, American Legion, they all have scholarships that they give to our students. And there are national search engines, which you absolutely can use. Um, we always caution parents not to pay them. Sometimes they'll ask for uh, recurring fee. Sometimes they'll ask for a flat, maybe 70 bucks. Um, we've got plenty of scholarships on our website that, that your students can be looking at. And then lastly, um, I just want to let you know the majority are online. And so we've gotten away from that paper trail that we used to have. Students can apply right online. They knew, do need to have a separate email account. Their Cottage Grove High School email account will close once they graduate. So it's important that right now they're using a um, email account that they can access even after they graduate. Um, they do need to read the directions really carefully, especially for due dates. That's just critical. Um, some might need a transcript. Very few need letters of recommendation, but sometimes they do. Um, oftentimes they'll need a resume or activities chart, and then they may ask them to answer a few questions, kind of not a full essay, but just maybe a paragraph, um, some information. And oftentimes, once they've written a few of those, they can use them over and over and over again for applications. And then maybe just keeping an idea of which ones they've applied for copies is really helpful. So um, I'm going to turn this back over, I think, to Lacey. And then um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end that you might have on scholarships. All right, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about um, because I just feel like Oregon Promise is so accessible to such a wide range of students. So a lot of you guys have probably heard of the Oregon Promise. It's been around for several years now. This is a state grant. And remember, grant is free money that your students do not have to pay back. Um, this is a grant that covers most of the cost of community college here in Oregon. Um, so I'm not supposed to say that it's free community college, but I'm going to say it's almost free community college. Um, it covers up to 90 attempted credits, which ends up being full time about two years at a community college. Um, and it covers a lot of the tuition for that. Um, students will fill this out in senior seminar class. We do our best to make sure all of the seniors fill this application out. It's very simple. It takes about 20 minutes um, and we'll be working on it um, in the upcoming months with them. And so they should be doing this um, in class with us. So this isn't something that parents have to worry about with um, making sure their students do because we will do our best to make sure they do it. Um, in order to qualify for the Oregon Promise, there are a handful of requirements um, that are, I think are very low barrier. So students have to graduate high school in Oregon. Check. Um, they need to be an Oregon resident, right? We live in Oregon. Check. Um, 
and there is a caveat that they need to have lived in Oregon for 12 months prior to enrolling at the college. So if they're a senior here now, they are eligible. Um, and then they need to enroll in a community college here in Oregon um, within six months of high school graduation. So what that will look like for our current seniors is that they need to enroll at Lane or at Umqua or at Portland Community College, whatever community college they want to go to, they would need to enroll for the fall after they graduate. So graduate in June, started college in September. Um, and the last um, qualifier is that they must have a high school GPA of at least a 2.0. Now this actually recently changed. So um, last year it was a 2.5 um, and the state of Oregon has updated it and now only require a 2.0 or higher in order to be eligible. So this catches a vast majority of our students. Um, and that means that students can use this money to head to any community college in the state. I'd like to remind students that there are more than just Lane. <laughs> I know everyone always thinks of, L of LCC, which is a fabulous school with a ton of programs, but there are other um, community colleges across the state that have other programs. So if you want, if your child wants to major in or get a two-year degree in fire science, they might need to go to Umqua Community College. If they want to be a vet tech, they might, they might need to go over over to Central Oregon Community College. If they want to major in mortuary science, they need to go to Mount Hood Community College. So there are programs all across the state um, and students are able to use the Oregon Promise to pay for programs at any of those community colleges, whether it's a full two-year degree, a one-year certificate, or just a couple of classes to become an EMT or a pastry chef, things like that. Um, and in the past, um, financial um, eligibility uh, has been a factor, um, but in the past couple of years, um, it has not mattered. Uh, for the past couple of years, family income has not been um, a factor considered when awarding Oregon Promise to students. Um, so if you guys have questions about this one, feel free uh, to shoot me an email because I'm happy to chat more about it. For students who are thinking about heading to a four-year university um, in state, I like to remind students that these programs exist. So um, I just like to call them four years free programs because I think it's the most straightforward language. Um, you'll hear different schools call them different things, um, but the bottom line is that the University of Oregon, Oregon State University, Portland State University and Western Oregon University all have one of these programs. And what it is, is if students meet two qualifications, um, they're eligible to have their tuition and fees at that school covered um, for four years. Um, the two qualifiers uh, or qualifying criteria are that they have to have um, a 3.4 high school GPA or better and they have to meet income requirements. And so this will be determined when we file your FAFSA. Um, we'll be able to get a better understanding of if you meet those income requirements. Um, there are um, There is one school, Portland State University, that actually doesn't require um, a certain GPA at all. If your student is admitted to Portland State and they meet income requirements, they're eligible for this program. So your student would be able to attend a four-year university without paying for tuition and fees and would need to think about um, things like transportation, textbooks, and room and board instead. I like to point out um, students don't need uh, to live on campus their first year if they live within 50 miles of campus. They've updated the, the range this year. So here in Cottage Grove, we live within 50 miles of the University of Oregon. And so your student will not be required to live on campus as a freshman. Um, so what that means is if they're eligible for the four years free program at the U of O and they choose to live at home, they could, in theory, go get a four year degree at the University of Oregon for the cost of transportation and textbooks. Um, so this is definitely something that is worth investigating. And many of our students every year are awarded these um, programs. So they, they definitely um, are something that our students benefit from. All right, and general tips for students. Um, I know it's really difficult, guys, but if it's possible, if you have a job, try to start saving some of that money now. 
um, it really is helpful, even if you're not saving enough to be able to pay a term out of pocket, um, saving just so that you're able to buy the textbook, you're able to put money in your gas tank, you're able to order a pizza on Friday night in your dorm. Um, those kinds of things will matter for your college experience as well. Um, and so saving money now is always a great option. Um, in bold here, you guys will see we have IDA accounts listed. Um, these are something that I think a lot of um, folks in um, in our county and in our area aren't familiar with. An IDA is an individual development account, um, and it's a money match program. So if you meet income requirements, um, and I think for Lane County, um, for like a household of one, um, the max income is like $43,000 a year. So if you make under that, and then it goes up according to how many people live in your household. Um, but if you meet those income requirements, um, you're eligible for this program and it's opening a savings account where you contribute and for every dollar you contribute, this nonprofit organization will help and contribute some dollars as well. So for example, um, Dev Northwest is um, an organization here in Lane County that provides this individual development account funds. You open an account with them and for every $100 that you put in, they might match it times five. So you put in $100, they put in $500. And you're able to build a savings much more rapidly. Um, and one of the things you're allowed to use these funds for is school. Now, if your student needs to use this money to ultimately purchase a car or put a down payment on a house, start a business, those are also options. Um, but it can also be used for uh, schooling and educational purposes as well. Students, it's really important to talk to your parents um, about a financial plan. Um, a lot of students are hesitant to talk to parents about um, asking for their 2021 20, tax returns to file the FAFSA. Um, start chatting with your parents now. Parents, start talking with your students um, and coming up with a plan for, um, for what everyone can contribute and what we can do to kind of um, minimize the amount of debt we're incurring to, to go to school. Um, really research and apply for scholarships. Like Vicki Evans said, there are so many dollars available for our students and it's available for a wide variety of students with a wide variety of experiences and educational backgrounds and aspirations. Um, and so scholarships can be absolutely crucial in paying for school. Um, again, make sure you file your FAFSA. Um, when Mr. Basting and I come into class um, and we start filling the FAFSA out together, um, please start it. Don't just ignore us. <laughs> um, getting it started now is, makes it easier to take it home to your parents and have them help you fill out the rest. Um, and then make sure that you're meeting all your deadlines. I know senior year gets a little bit hectic, but holding on to those handful of deadlines that you really have to meet, um, like college application deadlines, scholarship deadlines, um, deadlines for um, turning in your assignments to get things um, on your transcript in, in a passing grade. Um, just make sure that you guys are staying up to date on all of that this year um, because it will go very quickly and we just want you guys to stay on top of things. Sorry, I have to toggle back and forth when I'm turning the slides to put my to unmute myself. So um, just a few things for parents. It's a really good idea to start the conversations now about the financial plan for college um, and what realistically parents are able to contribute. Sometimes this conversation isn't happening and we get to April and May and students have this idea that they want to go to this particular school and that their parents have unlimited funds to help them get there. And that's not realistic all the time. And then they're disappointed and, you know, there's frustration. So if parents and kids can be having these conversations between now and say June, um, it's, it's really good for kids to know and be able to plan about what that's going to look like. Um, the biggest thing, again, I know we've said this over and over, we're like a broken record, but students need to apply for scholarships. So last year, every student that applied for the Cottage Grove Community Foundation was given a scholarship and every student that also applied for our local scholarships were also granted a scholarship. So 
we try our best to make sure that the funding is kind of spread throughout, but, but kids have, students have to apply. They have to fill that out to the best of their ability neatly, um, make sure it's done correctly and turned in on time. Again, um, starting on the FAFSA would be great if you could get that done in the next month or two. And then probably the most important thing, and we talked a lot about this during COVID, is if a parent's financial situation has changed due to a number of things, health issues, change in employment, change in marital status, whatever that could be, it's really important for the kids to contact the financial aid office because oftentimes that school can then make changes in the student's financial aid package. So um, it's really important to make sure there's conversations happening about that as well. Okay, just the last few additional tips. Uh, I mentioned this earlier that um, students need to reapply for the FAFSA every year that they want to attend school and receive those funds. Uh, so again, make sure you keep your, your FSA ID, username, and passwords, the email that you used and the application, make sure you keep all of those in a safe place that you remember, you know, maybe it's like your notes in your phone or something like that. Um, for students, you know, keep a copy of your transcript. You can call the high school after you graduate and get a copy of it. But if you can keep a PDF copy in your email or in your Google Drive, um, it's really helpful to just have those handy. Um, and we've talked a lot about this with the students to make sure you have a, a good email address. Um, again, not your school email, but some personal email um, that the students are going to keep continue using after high school. Um, and as you continue to you know, gain experience, whether it's working, whether it's community service, extracurriculars, um, if you do other um, things like job shadows and things like that, make sure you keep your up your resume updated. Or if you have an activity chart, something like that, make sure you keep those updated. So if you're ready to apply for another scholarship or the next year when you want to apply for other scholarships, um, you don't have to spend hours going back and recreating that, those documents. Um, and then I guess if there is a name change of any sort, um, make sure you do that quickly as soon as possible and then also if you did, th did that after you applied uh, make sure you contact your school as well am i doing this one lacy okay so we do have a fafsa help night november 2nd at 6 30 so we will be here in the cafeteria at 6 30 and we will bring Chromebooks. We'll probably bring some refreshments, maybe some cookies to try and lure you guys in. If you have, if you have any questions about the FAFSA um, or if you need help filling out the FAFSA, again, you don't have to come down if you've already done it. Um, but if you have questions, concerns, comments, and you need help, um, please come see us on November 2nd at 630 and bring your tax returns with you, please. Um, if you guys have any other questions, I'll stop the recording right now and you guys can feel free to unmute yourselves and ask any questions that you have. So thank you very much for being here. Um, and.